Okay, so we see here that it's very critical to have techniques that are sufficiently flexible to use or uh, to introduce and deal with hyperparameter. That is also very important to uh, build surrogates. And this is uh, now I will discuss another point about this, this surrogate construction for the Bayesian uh, inference. So here's yeah, just what I have said before. I slightly simplifying the problem to, uh, to, to return to the original formulation. So the lightest one. And what we want to do is to build a polynomial expansions uh, for this uh, model prediction UI of Q in order to uh, really speed up the evaluation of the likelihood and uh, perform a sampling by uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain. Okay, so uh, one of the very interesting results in other, another work from Youssef with uh, Dong Bing Shu was that if instead of using the true model, so instead of having here UI, you're using a polynomial uh, expansion or polynomial approximation, so U hat in terms of U, uh, you can bound the error that you're committing on the posterior uh, in terms of the uh, KL divergence. Okay, so this is the expression that is given here. So it's the log of the uh, posterior divided by the approximated posterior and this is an average with respect to the uh, posterior. So it's really here the KL uh, divergence definition. And you can bound this error by a constant, okay, times the roughly the L2 error on your surrogate. So very nice results. And it certainly uh, suggests that you could, you should actually construct a surrogate that minimize this error for sure. Uh, so minimizing ui minus u hat in L2 sense with respect to the prior uh, measure. However, uh, there is a small problem in this bound is that the constant in this bound is depending on the observation. Okay. And what is happening is that if the observation are very, very informative so that the prior concentrates into a very narrow posterior, this norm here is not able to control this error on a very narrow domain. Okay. So the constant here can become very large. Imagine that your uh, observations are so informative that the posterior is a delta function, a Dirac. Then what you want to have here is a L infinity norm, because you want the error to be very small where it is important, that is on the support of your Dirac mass. Okay, so instead, what we want to do is to construct, it's on the next slide, a, a, a surrogate that minimizes the error, not in terms of the prior measure, but in terms of the posterior measure, because we want the approximation to be accurate where the posterior distribution is important. We don't care where. We are not going to explore these areas. Okay. But of course, the posterior is not known. Okay. So the a priori construction of the surrogate, mean, so the U hat minimizing this uh, error here, is not possible because we don't know the posterior. Okay. So what we are proposing is to uh, proceed by, uh, in, a, in an iterative uh, approach, where sequentially we will update the surrogate UH. Okay trying to minimize the error on what is the current uh, estimate of the posterior and repeat. Okay. So the way we update the surrogate is by taking new observations that are drawn from the current posterior estimation. Okay. So in the following, I will denote D a set of coordinates, function or prediction value, and also this triplets as a last component that is rho j, which is a trust index that I will explain later on. So imagine that at some point in the algorithm, we have selected n of these triplets. So value of, uh, sorry, location 
of the parameter, or value of the parameter, prediction, exact model prediction, and uh, some uh, trust index value. What we do then is that using this uh, set of uh, triplets, we extract a subset, I will explain how later on, to construct the surrogate here, where we try to minimize the error, mean square error, over the set of selected points. Okay. So here you have classically uh, the mean square error, so it's just a regression problem. But the regression problem is weighted by the trust index that I still have to explain. Okay. And here we also introduce some sparsity enforcing terms, uh, just because we want to use sufficiently polynomial basis, and we don't want to care about stability of this regression problem. Okay. So we are trying to find a sparse approximation that minimizes this uh, sum of weighted residual here on a specific set of points. Once we have this new surrogate, uh, we plug it into the likelihood. Okay. So it's now the, the posterior as the case a step of the iterative scheme where we have this likelihood given with this uh, approximated surrogate. We can draw several independent samples from this posterior distribution. So this is the stage where we complete our uh, set of design points. We evaluate for these uh, new samples the exact model. Okay. And now we can define the trust index by comparing what is the actual value of the complete model with respect to the value predicted by the current surrogate. Okay. And if what we actually compute is close to what we estimated with the surrogate, it means that, well, in this area, the surrogate was quite good. So we can trust the point we drew with the surrogate. Okay. So the trust index will be close to one. Or, or will be large. On the contrary, if we discover that, uh, well, when we evaluate the true model, we get something that is far away from uh, the value that was predicted by the surrogate, it means that mm, drawing point using this posterior is very dangerous and we should not be confident into this guy, so the rho i will be very small. Okay. So when it goes back into this minimization problem, points in which that you trust have high weights and points that you don't really trust have very low weights. Okay, so it's a way to, uh, to, to make sure that you don't get things that uh, completely jump all over the place and become completely aberrant. So here is uh, just a summary of the, uh, of the algorithm. You start by uh, drawing initially according to the prior distributions and you construct the first surrogate. This gives you the first estimate of the likelihood you do new point, estimate uh, the trust and associated trust index, and then you repeat, update your surrogate, draw new points, update surrogate, and draw new points. Okay. However, when you, draw, when you build the surrogate, you don't necessarily want to use all the points you have computed so far, because some may be just drawn from parts that are no more important. So what we do is that we consider larger and larger set of points, but we disregard a certain fraction of the set D. Okay. Typically, we try to maintain half, or the last half of the, co the computed point into the uh, approximation. But mm -hmm. the approach is quite robust to this parameter. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happened on a very elementary example. The true model is this uh, uh, function, so exponential of uh, hyperbolic tangent. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a red function. Uh, the yellow or green uh, Gaussian is here, is the prior. And we have a single observation that corresponds to this point located at Q equal to 3.8. Okay. So we have an observation where we say, okay, uh, we measure 2 point something, 2.6. Okay. And now we want to update this distribution. So clearly it should be pushed to the right. Okay. Uh, it won't be Gaussian anymore because the model is not Gaussian. Okay, it's uh, more complicated than that. But of course, uh, depending on the assumed value for the noise, it will be more and more or less around the uh, measured value. So here is what we have. If we have a very large measurement noise, uh, the prior is somehow displaced. It remains nearly Gaussian. But you see now it's centered around maybe 1.5. 
if the noise level is decreased, you get closer from two point, uh, well, around three. And as you decrease the noise level, you get something that becomes sharper and sharper around the value uh, 3.8. Okay. The different uh, pink curves that you have are the evolution of the um, surrogate-based posterior with the index K. So you see that in just one iteration here, you nail the problem. Here, maybe you need three or four iterations to get the exact uh, or a very good posterior estimation. And here, you maybe need a little bit more in the same here. Okay, but the system is converging, while initially you don't have any observation. And what you have here in green is the successive surrogates. Okay, so you see that it absolutely don't care about being accurate in this part, because this is a very unlikely uh, uh, part of the domain, but it's very for focusing the accuracy only in the part where we have a significant posterior. Okay, this is the same kind of, the same example, but now we are changing the polynomial degree. So it's, there is some stability. Uh, however, for uh, some degrees, it's very important to have this um, trust index because if you don't, sometimes, because the surrogate model uh, could have another uh, value on the left, far on the left, you could draw some points very far on the left because your polynomial model can predict a correct value here. Imagine here, second order, it means quadratic, so it's a parabola. So you have another intersection here with the observed value. So you, you will draw actually points here, but you will observe that when you solve or uh, evaluate the exact value, you're, you should be somewhere close to zero where you predicted 2.8, so it's very far away. And then the trust index goes to zero and it's disregarded in the construction. Okay, uh, this is another example. Uh, it's an elliptic field, so we are trying to learn the coordinates in, again, uh, a, a reduced basis uh, based on the KL expansion. I think we have 15 modes, so we have to learn 15 coordinates. This is convergence of the trust index. is just to show that um, it, 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 it's stopping at a very high value, meaning that essentially all the points you draw are on part where the surrogate is uh, is actually uh, accurate. In that case, uh, what you have here is the number of uh, simulation. Also, this is really the computational cost. This is uh, the error um, for our uh, iterative surrogate approach. The polynomial degree is increasing with the computational cost because uh, we have more and more points to build the polynomial approximation in that case. Uh, this is the dimension of the polynomial basis. So at the end, we evaluate uh, 400 uh, polynomial coefficients. And this is a comparison with the case of a global surrogate uh, construction, uh, trying to make the computational cost comparable. So this is actually the number of uh, model evaluations that is needed for the global surrogate construction. And here you have the ratio of the error okay. so for the surrogate. So basically here, on that case, we save, uh, well, for the same computational cost, we have uh, an accuracy that is 10 times better. Okay? And here is a comparison of how the uh, two models between prediction and reality are, uh, are sitting. Uh, what's more interesting is the case where uh, you effectively concentrate the posterior. Okay? So there are two ways of concentrating the posterior. It's by lowering the, um, the measurement noise, okay? So you will trust more and more your observation and concentrate the posterior. Or another way is to make as different as possible uh, the posterior and the prior, and here this is what is done by um, making the, um, the, the map point uh, further and further from the origin. So it's making the problem more and more difficult. So the coefficient delta bar here measures the distance from uh, the map point to the origin. And now uh, we see that our approach uh, is yelling, uh, is, is giving an error that is uh, 10,000 times smaller than for a global surrogate, uh, while the computational cost is the same. I mean, in fact, here it was not even possible to, uh, to run uh, this case uh, for, the, for the largest one. So huge 
uh, computational saving, although it's iterative, but the convergence is very fast, and you can really focus the uh, computational effort in this area. This is what is happening. So again, we are comparing the prediction of the uh, posterior and the true posterior value uh, for the sample value of k. Uh, so if, if the model was perfect, all the points would be on the blue line. Uh, you have some uh, red crosses here that are the iterative surrogate, and you see that they remain very close to the blue line. And while the cloud here of points is the global approach, which is completely off because it's not able to predict correctly uh, the, uh, the value in, in these points that are so far from, uh, from the origin. Okay. Last point I want to discuss is, uh, so we have techniques to uh, effectively deal with hyperparameters, uh, construct um, surrogate models. Um, so that was part of the discussion we had uh, in the group yesterday about, uh, but what we haven't touched so far is uh, the observations. I mean, we are given the observation and we, we, we try to do our best with this observation, but we don't want to touch them. And I, I think this is a big, uh, big error. Okay. And this is what I want to illustrate in this example. So it's a problem uh, we work uh, at cost with uh, Maria Navarro, postdoc of uh, Omar. And uh, it's, it's an attempt to uh, infer some uh, parameters of a very nonlinear model uh, that describe a flow of debris. Okay, so debris flow for landslides, or I don't know exactly what it is. But here you have the governing equation, so it's a uh, it's conservative equation with some nonlinear source term here, the phi that I will discuss later on. And this equation are solved with GeoClo. Okay, so it's, it's a model of the literature, and you can even find on the internet uh, the code and uh, all the settings to solve this problem. So here are the nonlinear uh, source term of these equations. Um, well, just to, to show that it's quite complicated, but it involves some parameters that are actually uh, quantities that cannot be uh, measured directly, but must be inferred from, from some uh, experiments. And based on uh, existing uh, work by Iverson and George, uh, we reduce the set of uncertain parameter to just five of them. So the, the static critical state solid volume fraction, the initial hydraulic permeability K0. So it's, it's really the flow of a mixture of gravel, muds of everything. So it's kind of porous media. So you have hydraulic permeability initially. You have a pure fluid viscosity mu. Uh, that is the viscosity of the fluid into the, uh, or around the debris. Uh, steady friction contact angle phi that prescribe when the debris start to flow uh, depending on the slope. Uh, on which they are lying, and you have a compressibility constant A that affects the behavior of the mixture, uh, how it reacts to, to compression. Okay, so to learn these coefficients, uh, or this model coefficient, uh, we have uh, a get release experiment. So it's a channel, I think it's 70, no, it's more than that, but at least 75 meters long, five meters across. There is a gate, they prepare the mixture of gravel, muds, and everything, and then they open the gate. The, uh, the, the, the debris flow downward, okay, and at several locations downstream, they are measuring the debris eight. Okay, so what the measure are is an eight of debris as a function of time. So this is a location that is close to the gate, somehow uh, further down, down, down the slope and even further on. Okay. So you see that initially there is no debris, then the mass of debris is arriving, you go, you reach a maximum, and then you decay as the mass of debris continue to flow down. Okay. So these are the experimental uh, results, and what they consisting is actually an average value, which is a thick blue line, very noisy, and some variance at the function of time. So actually it's discrete value at different times. So it just made continuous for the purpose of graphical representation. But what you have is at a certain time, an average value of H and a standard deviation. That's it. Okay. So.
So, what can you do with that? Well, you can run the model with different values of uh, the parameters, get a prediction for the signals, and compare to the measurements. Right? This is the straightforward way to proceed. But the first thing you have to decide is uh, the a priori, a priori range of this parameter. And this is already a big, big issue. Actually, we spend, I don't know, maybe six or eight months to fix this uh, a priori range. Why? Because the model uh, generates things like transverse waves, uh, breakup of uh, the mass of debris, uh, lots of things that cannot be reflected, actually, in the observations. Okay. Either because it's clearly not present in the observation, but uh, if you have discontinuity in the regimes and the behavior, say if you have fragmentation of the mass of debris, uh, this is really going to be an issue to construct a smooth surrogate, right? So the first thing we did is to find ranges where the physics was sufficiently simple to come up with a surrogate and looks to be consistent with the measurement. Similarly, if you have gener uh, the appearance for some parameter value of transverse wave, uh, it means that waves can go in one direction or the other. Okay, so there is no unicity of the solution. And so how do you account for that in the observation? Well, you don't know the, the observation were corresponding to, say, transverse wave going to the left or going to the right. So that's a big problem. So we solve this issue by considering a 1D model. So no more transverse wave. That's what we found was actually the more reason. So after all this work, what we come up is with this uh, a priori uh, model with a priori range. And what you have here in, uh, in light red is the uncertainty range. So 95% confidence interval based on this a priori range. And you see that the agreement with uh, the measurement, even for the a priori, is not that good, right? I mean, here you see that the decay is much faster for the model, irrespective of the value of the parameter. Uh, the arrival time here are not very good. Okay. We are missing here things that are completely crazy that we don't know where it's coming from. But lots of issues. Okay. 